The world crosses 10 million cases of coronavirus and over 500,000 deaths. The United States looks like it's managing it pretty poorly and is facing a pretty big surge at this point in time. And I'm going to answer the question, come on, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, the honey badger virus. Is it a big deal or is it not a big deal? Let's take a look. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Chris Martinson here with your SARS-CoV-2 update for June 30th, 2020. And uh, let's go right in to the numbers here. Coronavirus cases, uh, 10,447,000 now, uh, over 500,000 deaths. And um, things are looking uh, like they're really picking up across the world. And if we go deeper into the numbers, you see there are a number of states out there, countries that have surging cases. As I covered last time, it's possible that you get one big fat wave and you have to just sort of get through that. And you you decide as a country, you're going to go through that slowly or quickly. And uh, so we'll show you some of the data about how that's hitting places like India, things like that. Um, so if we let's see, where am I going to go next? Uh, yeah, so um Right now, I think what we're seeing here is we're seeing, uh, yeah, let's we'll just go continue the numbers. Sorry. New records in the United States. This is looking at the seven-day moving average here in this blue line. This is a brand new high for the seven-day moving average here. Whoop. Well, terrible drawing there, but let's see if I can get that go straight across a little bit more. Not really, but anyway, close enough. Um, we're hitting brand new highs here. However, deaths do remain subdued. We can see here that the deaths are clearly uh, continuing to trend down. A couple of reasons for that. First, we managed this really poorly at the beginning. Putting people on ventilators, wrong thing to do. Uh, as well, in New York State, they moved people with COVID into nursing homes. That did not uh, go very well. That was a bad decision. But uh, guess what? That was the decision that was made. And that contributed a lot to this early spike here in deaths. And we had that daily deaths hitting highs of around 2,500. That's what that number would be right there, about 2,500 across there. So these deaths are trending down, but that could change. Um, and the reason is because there's so many more cases now. And if we see here in California, Riverside County, hospitals are at 99% capacity for the ICU beds. And um, they're reporting now that their intensive care units have uh, nearly hit capacity, 99% is, I, what's that one bed left over? Um, and uh, suspected and confirmed coronavirus patients account for about 35% of those beds. So about a third. Here's the deal. Uh, most places do not have a lot of extra uh, ICU beds just hanging around. And so uh, it doesn't take much to fill them all the way up. So just a third of those beds being filled up here by coronavirus patients and next thing you know, boom, out of capacity. And that's leading U.S. Rep Representative uh, Paul Ruiz here to say, I am calling on the county to immediately reverse their decision to rescind public health safety measures and reinstate their order to wear masks in public and to transparently communicate their social distancing and stay-at-home surge intervention plans and enforcement mechanisms. Uh, and, um, yeah, local health authorities said the official numbers on bed capacity paint a misleadingly bleak figure uh, picture here. Um, but, in fact, it, it's not really a, a good picture when, you're, when your beds are all full. I'm not sure what's too misleading about that. And, by the way, they create overflow ICU bed units out in the hallways and other places where... They're farther away from uh, the clustering of the talent that's there, usually in an ICU unit, all the nurses, doctors, PAs, everybody that's involved in uh, attending to people who are in critical condition. If you start moving them into other places where you call them ICU beds, but they're way down the hall or on different floors or things like that, that can uh, not be a, a good thing. So when we look at the manager scorecard for the United States, look at this gap between the EU here in black and the United States in blue, here's how the EU has managed this whole process. And uh, they're very much uh, down here in, in a very contained sort of an environment. The United States uh, ran out of patience, I guess. And so here we are uh, back up at brand new all-time highs. And by the way, that's seven-day rolling average. So you see that topping out at about 32K here. But actually, individual daily counts are well over 40,000 right now. Anthony Fauci was on the news today saying that, hey, that could be over 100,000 if we're not careful and we don't start doing things differently. And by the way, uh, this is just a few states. Uh, Arizona leading the pack here, Florida, South Carolina, Texas, and Georgia, California. 
So we look at that. These are the states here that are leading this surge. And that's a pretty big chunk of the U.S. economy. Uh, California and Texas are very, very large. California, if it was its own economy, I heard it would be number seven in the world. It's a very, very big economy. So if California goes into extended shutdown or new shutdown, well, that, that could really have a, an economic impact. But you wouldn't know it from the stock market because, of course, the Federal Reserve under Jerome Powell will do everything possible to make sure the stock market only goes up so that billionaires can continue to have a really rich plate of grapes to choose from uh, on a daily basis. So thanks again for that, Jerome Powell. We're very pleased. Dozens of billionaires are very much giving you golf claps with uh, white-gloved hands in the background. So good going there, Federal Reserve. Uh, your No Billionaire Left Behind program is really uh, just kicking butt these days, doing good. All right. Um, so when you look at this, though, the pace of – look at this slope here. The United States is having a second wave here, if you will, or these more more accurately, these six states are having their first waves. But the pace of it's really quite extreme. It's the same angle. It's a very, very steep climb. And that stands in really, really uh, sharp contrast to what we see down here in Europe, including the UK. So no question that it makes sense for Europe to say, you know what, we're going to limit travel from the United States Although I would argue that the United States uh, first imported a lot of cases back in March uh, when they had that whole, uh, you know, come on home, everybody order. And, and our, our airports were swamped with people stuck in six hour long customs lines trying to get back in through JFK and stuff like that. So remember, if you are going to manage uh, a pandemic, you want to hit it fast and strong. If you can, I showed this same chart last time. If you're fast and weak, well, that's still better than uh, being slow. Slow and weak being the worst. So if you're slow and weak, um, you know, this is sort of the response you get. And by the way, the United States is going back this way on this whole thing. Um, so we would contrast ourselves from the UK, Italy, France, Spain, Belgium even. So the United States is about to become a lone holdout here and will be uh, the one country here. That's going to uh, see that uh, really big resurgence. That's what it looks like. How bad is it? Well, the CDC has come out and basically they just shrugged their shoulders. Ah, time to give up. Uh, the CDC says the U.S. has way too much virus to control pandemic as cases surge across the country. This is from June 29th, today being the 30th. Uh, the coronavirus spreading too rapidly, too broadly for the U.S. to get it under control, as some other countries have. Dr. Annie Shuchat said, Principal Deputy Director of the CDC, uh, the U.S. stands in stark contrast to countries like South Korea, New Zealand, Singapore, as it continues to report over 30,000 new infections per day and now 40,000. This is really the beginning, Shuchat said here. So let's look at um, uh, this article here. And uh, really, the CDC is just in give up mode at this point in time. Like, what are you going to do, Right. Uh, as the U.S. has set records for daily new infections in recent days, as outbreaks surge mostly across the South and West, the recent spike in new cases has outpaced daily infections in April when the virus rocked Washington State in the Northeast and when public officials thought the outbreak was hitting its peak in the U.S. We're not in the situation of New Zealand or Singapore or Korea, where a new case is rapidly identified and all the contacts are traced and people are isolated who are sick and people who are exposed are quarantined, and they can keep things under control. Uh, the one thing, I just wanted to raise this because uh, uh, Dr. Shuchat here forgot the one thing, which is everybody wears a mask. This <laughs> is so simple. If everybody wears a mask, it's it, this is a very containable, controllable thing. Without that, you're right. Just tr you might as well just shrug and toss your hands in the air and go, well, what are you going to do? Right? Uh, not much we can do about that. All right. A number of you sent this to me. I am tracking this. I'm looking into it. There is reports of another virus, this time an H1N1, an influenza, with the possibility, some of the hallmarks, it could become a pandemic, but really very, very early, a little bit more of a, a clickbaity title than something I'm actually worried about at all at this point or anybody should be worried about, but it, it, it deserves being watched. Uh, H1N1 has, has uh, um, reared its head time and time again as a potential uh, pandemic virus and it seems to have a little trouble getting off the ground because, you know what, it's trying to do a legit species jump from uh, pigs into humans. And, of course, it doesn't uh, replicate as well inside humans as it does pigs. So it's, it's a tricky jump. That species jump isn't easy, but, you know, SARS-CoV-2, the honey badger virus, 
Crazy. Has the highest affinity for human cell lines. It binds so strongly that it's infected tigers. It infects ferrets. Allegedly, it came from a bat. Probably works in pangolins, but certainly works in humans. What a crazy virus to have just come out of nowhere in terms of uh, having a natural reservoir. Or it came from a lab, which is actually what I think happened. It was serial passage and gain-of-function research. And um, boy, what a big story not being talked about there. But uh, at any rate, we got to live with it. So here's here's where we are in this story right now. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who are saying, look, this thing isn't really that big of a deal. SARS-CoV-2, big deal or not a big deal? So you can say, well, it's a big deal. Or you can say, well, it's not a big deal. And I see both sides of this uh, story. And, and whether it's a big deal or not a big deal, of course, probably depends on whether you're older or younger, whether you have a comorbidity or not whether you happen to have some sort of immunosuppressive um, condition or not, right? So you, what might be a big deal to you might not be a big deal to somebody else. So let's look at, let's look at this from both sides. All right, here's why we might say it's not a big deal. Um, first, check this out. UK deaths now have fallen below the five-year average. And this is because a very few people are still dying in the UK from the coronavirus, but because everybody's in lockdown, because they're not out, drinking and getting sloshed and, you know, falling into ditches on the way home or however you harm yourself uh, while drunk or uh, people aren't out working or they're not, you know, accidentally falling off train platforms on their way in to commute into work or anything like that. Because people are in lockdown, they're actually leading safer lives and maybe even more stress-free lives. So maybe there's fewer heart attacks. Don't know. But when you look at the overall death count now, the UK deaths have fallen below a five-year average. So we could say on that basis, not only is COVID-19 not really a big deal, um, but it's it's actually, things are actually better now under it, at least from a mortality standpoint, mortality. We're going to, we're going to challenge whether that we should only be asking how bad COVID is on the basis of mortality. Are you dead or not, right? Because um, there's a lot of evidence now to suggest that even if you've recovered from it, so-called, uh, maybe not such a good deal. All right. Here's uh, more stuff that says maybe COVID's not a big deal. Antibody tests point to lower death rate for coronavirus than first thought, okay? Um, and this is uh, nearly a month old, but I thought I'd throw it in here. Mounting evidence suggests that uh, the coronavirus is more common and less deadly than first appeared. The evidence comes from tests that detect antibodies to the coronavirus in a person's blood rather than the virus itself. And by the way, a lot of these serological tests were kind of bunk, and, and we tore them apart back then, but still take them at face value. It says the tests are finding large numbers of people in the U.S. who were infected but never became seriously ill. And when these mild infections are included in coronavirus statistics, the virus appears less dangerous. The current best estimates for the infection fatality risk are between 0.5 and 1%. Okay, and that's overall. And so that would be obviously um, much, much more heavily concentrated in, in people over 85 or over 75, wherever you draw the line compared to people who are younger. And that's in contrast with death rates of 5% or more based on calculations and included only people who got sick enough to be diagnosed. Those, that's the case fatality rate with tests that detect the presence of a virus in a person's body. So the case fatality rate is still actually a pretty big deal. Uh, if you do present and you do actually have um, uh, an illness that gets you into the hospital from COVID, um, things can go pretty bad and a lot of, lot of data around that. Well, is SARS-CoV-2 a big deal? This comes to us from Sandpuppy. He's an ER doc. He posts at our site, Peak Prosperity, a lot. Here's the link down here. Um, he writes, I am very distrustful of authorities also, and I'm certain we've been repeatedly lied to, as am I. We've been lied to a lot about things like remdesivir. And by the way, remdesivir just got uh, the government, U.S. government is going to buy $1.2 billion of this stuff, and it's pretty much failed every single trial. All they could point to was that one NIH trial, which said, well, it looks like it cuts the hospital days down a bit, but didn't do anything for mortality, didn't do anything for viral load or shedding, didn't do anything, right? Uh, meanwhile, hydroxychloroquine, fantastic results coming out of some places, uh, but of course you have to administer it early and with zinc, stuff like that. Um, at any rate, uh, we've been lied to. I'm certain we've been lied to as well. Continuing on here, quote, Sand Puppy writes, if I did not previously work in a hospital and have a network of friends still employed in hospitals, I might doubt that COVID existed or was serious, right? So some people are actually questioning how serious it is uh, or whether it even exists, right? But he continues, I email my old buddies employed at all levels of the medical system, doctors, nurses, and respiratory therapists at several hospitals where they work and ask them, 
How are your COVID cases doing? Are you seeing deaths? Are young people getting admitted? I have a personal friend who is now a pulmonary cripple after a quote unquote mild case of COVID. She can only walk a hundred feet without stopping to rest. She cannot make a sandwich in her kitchen without sitting on a stool positioned in the middle of her kitchen. So with that insider's perspective of personal friends, I can confirm that COVID is real. Okay, so that would put it under the big deal category here. Um, Second, continuing on here, this is an article that comes out of Times of Israel here. says, it's frightening, doctors say, half of cured, in quotes, COVID patients still suffer. Benai Brock woman tells the Times of Israel that a month after testing negative, she has severe fatigue and anxiety. And her husband is worse than when he was hospitalized. So this came out on June 28th here. Severe fatigue and anxiety. Anxiety. You know, we're starting to hear more and more about things like that. So this comes from that article uh, from the Times of Israel. It says here, recovered COVID patients are baffling doctors with complaints of freak pains, lungs that just won't get back to normal, which we've heard about before, and a range of incapacitating psychological issues. This is this is starting to appear more and more. What we are seeing is very frightening. Professor Gabriel Izbiki of Jerusalem's Shari Zedek Medical Center told the Times of Israel more than half the patients, weeks after testing negative, are still symptomatic. In B'nai Brak, at Israel's first community clinic, doctors have been seeing a spike in recent days in the patients with pains that appear to come from nowhere. That's an odd one. Pains that appear to come from nowhere. It can appear in the arms, legs, or other places where the virus doesn't have a direct impact. And if you ask about the pain level on a scale of 1 to 10, can be 10 with people saying they can't get to sleep. Hmm. It's something which we're starting to see much more in the last week. A patient from the clinic spoke to the Times of Israel in condition that her name is not published. She was diagnosed in March, tested negative a month ago, but the woman, a resident in her 40s, has severe fatigue and anxiety and can only walk a few minutes at a time. Her husband, who also caught coronavirus in March and tested negative last month, now feels like he's broken, she said. He's actually worse than when he was hospitalized. He's 55, had some health problems before contracting coronavirus in March, but was active from morning till night. With plenty of energy, he's now extremely lethargic, can hardly walk, and has heart problems, she said. Continuing on with the same article, um, within the symptoms that we checked for revealed general weakness among the majority of patients. Okay, so general weakness, that's a big sign. Alongside shortness of breath, yep, no surprise there. Sustained cough, that would fit with lung damage, and other complex breathing and pulmonary issues. So all stuff I think we would have expected. Uh, he, this person is also uh, familiar with the freak pains that Sh- uh, Schenker discussed. These pains, seen in young and old alike, have doctors scratching their heads. Schenker said, painkillers block the pain but don't relieve the source. But we don't know how to address the source, and you can't be on painkillers the rest of your life. While the pains are excruciating for some, others describe the pains more as a major discomfort. Burning sensations, tingling, or just hard-to-place sense that the limb does not feel normal, And the patients with these pains do not normally raise red flags during the main medical examinations. We check their lungs and hearts, and they have no disease. They have no neurological issues. We do scans. Can't see anything, but they have this pain. We're told about it again and again. So, hey, there's the train. On the basis of that, I'm going to say it's kind of a big deal. So this means there are things happening here that we don't know about Uh, that the coronavirus is impacting and the neurological conditions, which includes the anxiety, uh, psychiatric issues, plus these pains, these phantom pains, whether they're phantom or not, maybe they're very real in terms of actual damage in the body, not just phantom pains. But um, uh, with all of that, to me, that's a pretty big deal. And it speaks to the idea that we don't really have our arms around this yet. And if you gave me the choice of not catching this, I absolutely would, because to me, it'd be a big deal if I was suddenly struggling with what appeared to be lifelong uh, conditions. However, we don't know how long they're going to last. And the other thing we don't know from articles like this, is this 0.1% of everybody who got it? Is this, uh, you know, uh, are these people who would have presented with these sorts of things otherwise? What's the number? Is it 15%? Is it 30? Is it is it 90%? Is it two? Was it what? We don't know. So we don't really know how big a deal it is yet, but still, I'd have to say it's kind of a big deal. All right. Carrying on, uh, we see here in the Wall Street Journal that um, COVID-19 is overwhelming New Delhi's hospitals. So 
the government's worried that they might need 80,000 hospital beds, um, and that vastly exceeds the 13,200 that are available. So looks like uh, New Delhi's getting hit really hard. Um, so I would also score that as a big deal. And of course, we've always known that is the big deal in these things. Um, the big deal is when your hospital systems get overwhelmed, you always want to avoid that, if at all possible. Hey, uh, this just came out today. The FDA is going to ask for a vaccine to be 50% more effective versus placebo. I wrote on Twitter, aiming high, are we? Uh, 50% more effective versus placebo. And I'm not sure what they mean by effective. Is that actual viral loads? Is that uh, people self-reported uh, severity of illness? We don't know. But that, that felt like a pretty low bar being set there uh, by the FDA. So um, not not super excited by that. But that's maybe a hint that the FDA is looking at early data and is saying, oh, we're, we can't ask for 100% effectiveness. We can't ask for 80%. What can we ask for? They're saying 50%. All right. Uh, hey, you know, the new we got a new low for the Federal Reserve. You know, I, I'm of this uh, position and opinion that the Federal Reserve is busy feeding grapes to billionaires, and uh, it's just starving Main Street. And it's doing this very, very consciously and on purpose. And it just hit a new low today. And it's been plumbing new lows day after day. This is an emergency program. is run by the Federal Reserve. Now owns bonds issued by Warren Buffett's. Berkshire Hathaway. There is not a single way you could make an argument to me that Warren Buffett needs some Federal Reserve money. But what did they get? Well, they got a lot of Federal Reserve money. Berkshire Hathaway, a company valued at $426 billion, is listed as one of the dozens of companies whose bonds have been scooped up by the Fed lending facility. According to disclosures the bank made on Sunday, they also, um, uh, other blue chip names include Walmart, Exxon, Coke, you know, also had their bonds bought by the Fed. That None of these companies are having any trouble raising money in the capital markets. None. Zero. But the Federal Reserve decided they're going to go in and buy billions and billions of dollars of these companies' bonds. Um, at any rate, this is in CNN. Look at how the, the tone is starting to shift here right now. Still, the fact that Buffett's Berkshire, which is sitting on $43 billion in cash, now has some of its bond owned by the Fed program, underscores just how far the central bank is going to prop up the capital markets. And it raises concerns among some, it should be everybody, that the Fed experiment is distorting the normal functioning of markets. And yeah, you should be worried that you, you, the only concern I have is that you're using the future tense on this. Uh, has distorted and uh, enormously. Past tense, please. Warren Buffett, don't worry, the Fed's got your back. Peter Bookvar, a chief investment officer at Bleakley Advisory Group, wrote in a note to clients Monday, monetary policy has now reached a new low in the United States. Um, yeah, absolutely. So Powell wearing his mask, all wrong. Look at that. Look at that. Pull it up there, big boy. Um, he uh, says here, look at this, stocks climb on last day of best quarter since 1998. So just a huge burst of uh, stocks just having their best quarter ever during a quarter when 43 million people, 47 million people filed for initial claims for unemployment. The Fed is all in, all in. Here's some, no, they're not. They could always do more. Um, meanwhile, U.S. stakes are big and borrowing and have to cut to close massive budget gaps. And all the Fed can do is think, well, we're just going to crush more loans out there if we can, but we'll hand billions and billions to billionaires. And that's what they've been doing. And of course, that's really very corrosive thing to do. So check this out. When the Federal Reserve tried to help Main Street, here's their Main Street lending program. They announced it to great fanfare. Hey, we're not just helping Wall Street. We're helping Main Street too. They announced it on April 9th. It was launched on June 15th. That's 15 days ago. Program limit, 600 billion deployed. Zero. <clears throat> Big goose egg. But look at their definition of Main Street. You'll laugh like I am, I hope, because you have to laugh because it's tragically funny. Um, this is going to, will finance full recourse bank lending to U.S. companies with fewer than 15,000 employees or less than $5 billion in annual revenue? Uh, dude, Main Street is made of little mom and pop shops, uh, normally with less than 15 employees, not 15,000. Uh, they might have $5 million in revenue, not $5 billion. Uh, this has nothing to do with Main Street, but doesn't matter because they deployed none of it. Why? Probably because it has Main Street right in the title and who the heck cares about Main Street? Not this guy. Not this guy at all. Uh, shame on you, Jerome Powell. 
at any rate, things are getting a little dark out there. Uh, and we had that uh, case of uh, the suburban couple and he in his pink polo shirt, she in her, uh, I don't know, looked like the, the Hamburglar uh, shirt she was wearing, you know, black and white stripes, waving their guns outside of their uh, suburban mansion, for lack of a better word, against those protesters. But things went a little darker today in uh, Utah where uh, a car was surrounded by protesters, and you can plainly see that this person brought out a gun right here. That's what I'm highlighting right here. This person, um, get the right pen here. This person brought out a gun, and you here you can see that orange dot over here. That's, that's it was shot. It was fired twice, and the person in this car was struck, 60-year-old gentleman, uh, went to the hospital, had... Um, surgery, which was not, uh, he was not seriously injured, thankfully. Uh, but at any rate, you know, what's up next? Uh, protesters are going to be run over by people who'd rather not be shot while sitting in their vehicle, like sitting ducks. Uh, but this is a new low, a new turn. Things are getting dark. And part of that darkness, of course, is because it's grapes for Team Elite, and it's not even cucumbers for us. Look at this Main Street lending program. <laughs> This is just crazy. And by the way, the whole thing, even if they administered it, it's all loans. It's just loans. Um, and so it's just more ways to get in debt to a, an outfit, an organization called the Federal Reserve, that literally prints that money for those loans out of thin air and then demands uh, that you pay it all back with interest and all that other stuff. But even still with that, none deployed here, but they are busy uh, right now scooping up massive amounts of uh, bonds from major corporations and just shoveling money at those major corporations uh, at below market rates. So it's just it's just a giant hand away, handout. Um, and of course, that leads to social tensions and eventually it boils over like this. But these people are fighting the wrong people. It's not this. These these people aren't on the opposite sides of anything. We're all on the same side of this. It's really it's it's a system of control that hands money to itself. And the rest of us feel the pressure from that. And if it's misidentified, these are like two rats in a cage that are fighting each other, but they need to understand how that cage was built. I'm going to put out, I put out, a, I made a video about rats in a cage a while ago. I'm going to release that so you can see what I'm talking about, because I, I think that's a good one. All right. Uh, this is leading now to a lot of articles like this. This came out on June 29th. This is an op-ed in, um, or an editorial piece in Bloomberg saying coronavirus brings American decline out in the open. Um and uh, this is uh, pulled from the center of that article reading here, almost every systematic economic advantage possessed by the U.S. is under threat. Unless there's a huge push to turn things around, to bring back immigrants, sustain research universities, make housing cheaper, lower infrastructure costs, reform the police, and restore competence to the civil service, the result could be decades of stagnating or even declining living standards. By the way, for many people, those declining living standards have been happening for quite a while already. If capital begins to abandon the U.S., the dollar and the dollar in large amounts, the currency will crash and Americans will find themselves paying much more for everything from cars to televisions to gasoline to imported food. Interest rates will be raised in an attempt to lure back investment capital and the country might undergo a period of stagflation worse than the 70s. Large scale unrest would undoubtedly result and in the worst case scenario, the U.S. could collapse like Venezuela. All right. Uh, yeah, so th this, that's really, I, I see this large scale unrest continuing. I see all of these things, by the way, interest rates can't really be raised, not without literally crushing the entire country, but, uh, the national managers can't think of anything else to do besides just continue to throw grapes at, uh, the elite and, um, and hope for the best. And I don't think that's really going to work out. Uh, and if you want to know more about all of that, um, you know, I also for, uh, my subscribers at my website. I do presentations like this, but I focus a lot more on, A, the economic impacts, because I think those are going to be the ones that are going to be most dangerous for everybody, as well as what are the actual responses that you should uh, undertake. So I talk about the eight steps that people can take after romping through a lot of that data. So if you're into the economic data and you want to know more about where that's going um, and you want to uh, entertain what you can do in order to um, – uh, what steps you can take to make sure that you're safe and resilient going into the future. You can follow this link right down here, uh, peakprosperity.com slash eight steps. All right, conclusions for today. The U.S. badly managing the pandemic, just D minus right here. In the big deal, not a big deal debate, I fall into the big deal camp. I think you can understand why. I, and, and the big thing for me is that the effects of corona are really, they're just long lasting and 
too many people. And I don't know how many people it is. We don't have good data on that yet. But we don't know why. And that's the, that's the concerning part. We just don't know why. And we don't know how this is going to play out over the long term. We don't know if people are going to get it a second time. And if the second time is going to be worse. And we don't know if vaccines are actually going to work. And we don't know if this thing's going to mutate. There are all these unknowns, which leave it, all that uncertainty for me adds up to still big deal. Okay. Uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve, boy, they're taking really good care of the billionaires, large, super wealthy corporations. I call it the hashtag LNBB facility, uh, which is a waggish way of saying it's their leave no billionaire behind program. That's going really good. The, the billionaires are thrilled with the Federal Reserve right now, which means things are going to get worse before they get better, both, I think, in terms of COVID itself, but as well as the social impacts and the economic impacts. I think November is going to be uh, however the election turns out in the United States, one half the country is going to be just violently disappointed. And I'm using that phrase carefully. If the U.S. is unlucky, it becomes a failed, a completely failed state. But make no mistake, it's already failing. That's what um, the hydroxychloroquine and, and uh, embattled science, you know, the politicized science has told us. That's what all our institutions failing us. That's what that's what's already happening. Uh, the question is, does it fall beneath some critical level that makes it really, um, uh, you know, go in a very bad direction for a lot longer. Remember, it didn't have to be this way. Really didn't. Didn't have to be this way. So what can you do about it? Well, one simple thing that's kind of fun, uh, get a t-shirt, join a movement. These resilience t-shirts, United States produced all organic cotton. You buy one, wear it, send the pic to info at peakprosperity.com down here, and we will post that here at our Instagram page. Here you can see uh, just a screen grab uh, from some people who recently sent some pictures in. So awesome. Love seeing that. Look at that honey badger nursery. Love it. Uh, And look at all the gardening going on in these pictures. Just absolutely fantastic. Our garden is going well. I've never, Evie and I have never grown a, a broccoli that large. The onions are beginning to onion and bulb out there. Everything is just looking really sweet. It's coming in really good this year. But boy, that took a lot of work. All right. Remember, um, you want to boost your immune system as best you can. These are my personal immune uh, booster supplements right here. And um, oops, let me see if I can drag this back over a tiny bit. Um, no, I don't think I. Nope. Don't know what's going on here. It's a little off center. Don't worry about it. Hopefully, you can see everything. But uh, these are the things that I am taking, especially if I feel any sort of scratchiness in my throat. It's the elderberry syrup right there from this company. Gobble Mountain, Elderberry Company, Quercetin, Zinc, D3, Selenium. Can't hurt if you do feel sick. Maybe that cytokine storm is coming on. NEC and vitamin C powder, um, very important things to do. Remember, resubscribe to this channel if necessary. Also over at Twitter, uh, a lot of voices like ours are getting silenced, minimized, throttled, shadow banned, but mostly unsubscribed. You may find that you get unsubscribed from this channel. Happens to people all the time. So uh, anything you can do to... Um, uh, and pull that back in, uh, that avoid that, that would be, uh, and just resubscribe. That would be wonderful. So that's all I got for today. And, uh, again, if you're interested in uh, seeing more and, and joining, uh, at the website, we got a lot of free content there and we have some for subscribers as well, for people who like to go deeper and, or discuss things that are better left, um, behind a paywall and not out in public for a lot of very obvious reasons in these politically charged climate time. So at any rate, come on by. Love to see you there. Otherwise, I'll see you here uh, next week. And uh, sorry, today's only Tuesday. I'll see you on uh, Thursday. So that's all I have for today. See you in a couple days. Be well, be safe. Talk to you then. Hi, folks. Adam Taggart, co-founder of peakprosperity.com here. Listen, if you want to get your hands on that premium report that Chris mentioned, simply go to peakprosperity.com slash eight steps. It's a really good report. All right. Thanks for listening.